So good to be here again. Um, the so I don't have the nice small talk environment. I wish my whole environment was like some of the uh, tools we've seen. Then I could do some of the do some of the writing the whole presentation in small talk. I'll have to look at getting an environment like that to to do that with. And even though uh, I'm not a language guy, but I have affiliated with language guys, but I definitely uh, am about design and what do, does good design and how to keep design clean as you go. And uh, I've worked in industry a lot with a lot of languages, but really kind of starting off uh, with doing a lot with small talk back in the early days. Actually, list before that a little bit. but And just to give you a, back, a real quick background of where I came from, I evolved from the, the UIUC, what we called the Software Architect Group. Originally, it was a patterns group. Uh, and we were really, dead in the early 90s, we were really object-oriented, was growing, and at that time there was this big prom promise of how to make these nice reusable components and plug these things together, and what makes for good design. And, and we were really looking at how do you, how do you create good archi software architectures, or, or what makes for good reusable object design. And uh, Ralph had just, uh, you know, published, uh, he was involved with the Gang of Four Design Patterns book, and that was looking at a lot of systems, and, and being part of Ralph's group at that time, is we would look at a lot of systems, a lot of them being small talk because of Ralph, but we also looked at a lot of other systems that weren't small talk as well. Uh, and and uh, although we talked a good game, we noticed that a lot of times there's, there might be some problems with that. In fact, coming out of that, the first paper I actually did, there I am as a young guy in the 90s, I had, you know, I was much, much more agile and limber and a lot more hair. And Brian and I had published one of my favorite papers, and it was called Selfish Class. And it was, imagine you're a piece of code and you want to live. How do you do that? What kind of attributes should you have to be able to survive? What makes for good, reusable, clean design? And we had things like, we call it low surface to volume ratio. For example, that one is, uh, you know, it's it, like a sphere in the physical world is like that. And uh, with, with objects, you would think, oh, or, or components or software function or whatever is, you know, it's, it's a simple interface, but it gives you a lot of functionality, easy to use. We had things like it works out of the box, the one of the first kind of related to open source type thing, is you get something on Google it and find it, you get it, it has a better chance of surviving and replicating itself if it works out of the box. And uh, But lo and behold, me and Brian noticed that a lot of things aren't so nice. And as I mentioned yesterday, a lot of times we end up with more of these ugly type systems, big, what we call big balls of mud. And so why is this? Why is what we... Why are these so, the most successful architectures? There's more of these than these nice, beautiful architectures. And Brian and I talked about that, and we, we kind of focused on why is it so prevalent. And a lot of it was related to what Dick Gabriel talked about, which I would say is the first open source argument, is worse is better. Why there, There's something, uh, perfection is the enemy of good enough. In fact, that was one of the problems that I felt that small talk had had at the time, is sometimes they had kind of this, oh, we just have, just do everything should be in small talk, you don't have to worry about the rest of the world. Uh, just have this perfect thing. Why, why did uh, Windows win over Macintosh at the time, even though that's reversed a lot now? But at the time, it was uh, Windows was good enough. There is some kind of value and quality in being good enough. But how do you balance that and not get too much mud? Because <laughs> as we're working, we're going to create a little bit of messy things. So how can we evolve that? And one thing that Brian and I, when we looked at this, where does mud come from, there was a lot of things that we had focused on. And, and the core part of, if you read our paper, and if you Google Big Ball of Mud, you'll find the paper out there, and it's still talked about a lot today, which is, you know, a lot of people know me as a muddy guy, and it's not that, I, I, it's not that we were promoting muddy software, we were like, my mic is not working properly? Okay. Okay. How about now? Is that working better? Okay, uh, Muey Ben? Okay, much better. So one thing that Brian, Brian and I, when we were looking at this, is what causes big balls of mud? And maybe if we face it, and we face a reality, we can deal with it better as we evolve our systems. And three of our core patterns or principles that we talked about that cause big ball of mud is keep it working, piecemeal growth, and throwaway code. Spike solution if you're doing XP, for example. And... Wow, when you look at this, this is very core to Agile. So Agile didn't make this go away, but these are core things. The danger is that these things, if you don't, if you're not committed to keeping things clean, you can really have a problem. 
And lo and behold, we had this big promise in the early 90s about all this great reuse in object-oriented programming, but we failed. Most reuse is still done this way. Google something, find it, put it out there, copy, paste, tweak it a little bit. Okay, there I got it. And the problem with that, it can become like a cancer in your code if you're not careful. And you have to maintain a lot of this stuff. Uh, now, with microservices, one of the things I really like with microservices, the big push now is don't worry about reuse as much. If you get reused by accidental side effect, that's fine, but you just focus on your own independent services. And, and rather than focusing, sometimes too much energy and, and too many issues happen when you focus on that. And we've really changed the way we develop software today. We're in the, uh, that, that building there is actually where the first mosaic, the modern web browser, was done by Mark Andreessen. They should almost put a plaque on that that building right there at the University of Illinois. But we've really changed. He really did the same thing. Uh, we, we got this age of sampling or big bucket of glue. He took a lot of existing systems, didn't reinvent them, and just plugged them together and got it to work. And that's how things are really going in the app world, cloud computing. It's, it's exciting in a way, but things are different as we're evolving. So big balls of mud happen, and there's a lot of reasons that will lead to it. Uh, but should we even care? In fact, Kent Beck that does this implementation patterns book, this is actually a Java book, okay? And for those of you in small talk, I'm not here to insult you, but I mean, Java was actually influenced a lot. Gosling said he was influenced a lot by small talk and Lisp, and he wanted a better, he had to live in the C++ world, he wanted a better C++. And, uh, but, but when you look at this book, one, one, it's a really good uh, book, book focused on how to keep code clean. But Kent says this book is built on a fragile premise that good code matters. And you've seen, we've seen too much ugly code survive. And it's not necessarily sufficient. However, those of us that have to live there and maintain these systems and sustain this in the long term, it does matter to us. And in fact, this book was actually just a rewrite of small talk best practice patterns. 80% of it's exactly the same. I talked to Kent Beck in there, and that's really where all this came from. And it was really about good design, what makes for good design. And small talk influenced a lot of that meme or that mindset that went on. And, and so based upon that, and if we, if we look at that, how can, we, how can we make things better? So I went through this first part a little bit fast just to kind of get through because I really want to talk about what are some good refactorings that we can focus on. To you know, it, We want our code to be habitable. It's like my house. I'm not, I don't want it to be perfect all the time where you feel uncomfortable coming in and enjoying yourself, you need to come in and be comfortable, but I don't want it to be, you know, a total mess where you're even afraid to walk in the door. Same way with our software, I want to be able to, you know, as we're writing code, how can we make it more habitable or clean enough that I feel comfortable to get in there and make changes and figure stuff out? And so let's look at some refactoring that we can do that. And I want to talk about some just beginning safe refactorings. I don't, I could talk about this for an hour or two, or like Ralph said, I could probably talk about it for a day or two this morning when we were looking at it, but I really want to focus on this. Now, this is what Martin put in his book. Even he, he got a lot of this stuff from our group because we were we had been writing a lot about it. And PhD was done with a couple PhDs were done with Ralph originally about it with Bill Updike and Don Roberts. But refactoring is a discipline technique for changing the internal structure without changing the behavior. Really focused on keeping things working as it was before, which i.e. if you had bugs before, you have bugs after. And you can think even from the simplest refactoring, this is a very simple example, this is I borrowed from Don Roberts, is create empty class, you can think, oh, we have something like a doctor and a nurse and they're both medical professions, so how do we create this new abstraction about medical professions so we can keep track of some of the similar things? We create this new abstraction. And that's object-oriented design in a nutshell. But a lot of times as we're developing, when we start seeing these abstractions, how can we create, do this refactoring towards our code for that? This refactoring never breaks anything, right? Generally, it just creates a new abstraction until you do something with it, until you move code around. This should all work the same. In small talk, this is simple, right? It's, it's a simple thing to do. However, some refactorings can become very complex. You can think of, for example, like matrices. Matrices can be represented as an array, a matrix as an array, you know, an N by L matrix. On the other hand, we might think that, oh, it's using up a lot of memory. We have a lot of very large matrices and we want to optimize. I want to try some techniques for making it run faster. Maybe I want to put it on some embedded device um, with that. So if we try to do that type of stuff, things can take a long time time possibly, so we want to refactor it to have more efficient algorithms. So really, we, maybe we, rather than representing 
matrices of an array, we can do these first refactoring that matrices have an array representation. Now, this first refactoring doesn't break anything, but here we're moving from, which I think whenever I talk about the design patterns book, the design patterns book almost always favors delegation over inheritance in polymorphism and composition. Not all of them. There's a couple that still talk about inheritance, but uh, the majority of them really focus on that. So th this is where we're moving to where you really get more reuse is you move to delegation. So here, once we do this refactoring and we make sure nothing's broke, then we can start adding. Maybe we have sparse representations or identity representations, and then we can optimize on space and maybe performance at that point. To master refactoring, you have to be able to know what to change, and you have to know what's better. So if you're going to refactor, you really have to be able to think about, you have to know what good design. So if I think very long methods is good design, well, I'm not going to necessarily refactor to smaller methods, right? Or if I think having a 10-level class hierarchy is a good design, then, you know, but then I'm favoring inheritance over polymorphism. If that's the, the mindset, and sometimes I've seen when people first learn object-oriented, ooh, I get a lot of reuse out of inheritance. That's how, that's how you move to. So, but see, so really, you, it, what is your definition of a good design? But when you're refactoring, you're transforming from one design to another to hopefully add new features and evolve things as you go. So it's important when you do this transformation that you do it with a lot of small steps. I mean, if you go with this, if you take, when you're doing refactoring, if you're doing one big step, potentially if it goes wrong, you don't know what you broke. Here we were had some tightly coupled stuff and now we're maybe separating it out into maybe a strategy pattern or something like that. Um, but here, if we were doing a lot of small steps like extract method, replace conditional with polymorphism and move method, we can potentially uh, know what broke and we can back out and recover and move much quicker with that. So you always do it in a lot of small steps to get your design and then do a lot of testing and validation. So testing is a key principle of refactoring. Um, and, and it was promoted back even when the early refactoring browsers in Smalltalk, the first refactoring tools, were, were uh, actually came out. So as I, I'm going to now talk a little bit about refactoring, and I'm going to talk about some safe refactorings and go through a few examples. Uh, when, when I proposed some ideas, they said, Joe, we want you to talk 30 minutes about something else. I gave them a big list of stuff that they could pick from, and they told me refactoring and clean code. So I want to talk about that. But one thing I've noticed is refactoring definitely can affect your tests. So as I talk about the refactoring, I want to give you an idea of how it affects a test, whether it's a lot of rework, a little rework or not. So uh, a lot of times this, I, I was at one organization where they were hesitant to refactor because they were afraid how it would change the test. And I was like, wow, I always thought tests were supposed to make you happy to refactor. But if it, well, wait, not break the test. We have to refactor our tests or rewrite your tests. That's good. So as I showed yesterday, my top 10 code smells, you make huge gains into keeping code clean or towards evolving a legacy system, a big ball of mud, by just working, taking a lot of small steps and getting your whole team thinking about these top ten. You know, and so I want to go through a few of these and talk about some refactorings that we can do, some safe refactorings. Now, the first one that there, there's been a lot of research that's shown that simple things like bad formatting or dead code, things like that, uh, can cause a lot of programming, potential programming bugs. Yes, you have a question? I can barely hear you if you talk loud. If you yell, I can hear you. <laughs> Hi, sorry. I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? About 15 years ago or so, I wanted to mention this in your previous talk, I didn't have a chance. But it seems you can cover it up again. This thing about get to go, or get to go, is about 15 years ago there was a study in which a SQL file was changed to flag as warnings, um, duplicated C semantics, or contradictory C semantics. So this is if you have if, blah, 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 and inside of that, you have to test the same condition again, and that would be flagged as a warning. What was found was that those type of warnings were duplicated, go, go, and so on, were highly correlated to actual files. And just those compiler parts um, ended up, you know, flagging hundreds of bugs in the 
you see uh, the inner scrum and so on. So uh, it, it's not merely, this is what I want to offer you, it's not merely a subjective preference that their goal is about the very concrete evidence that their goal is about a piece of other thing. Yeah, I, I, I totally just, uh, dead code, it causes me to slow down. I have to read it and look at things a lot of times. And, and even just being able to have a nice format, it makes it easier to read, like paragraphs, things like that. So it's really to help the human beings with stuff. So here is exa actually an example in the Java library, believe it or not. And I know in, in the small talk, if you look at the small talk library, if, if I dug deep enough, I might have been able to find some. It's, it's matured enough that they've cleaned out most of that. But here is map. For map attributes, they have this big commented out. So I'm reading this, is this important? And it just returns something. They, why didn't they just delete that? Why do they even keep this type of commented code around? Sometimes dead code is hard to tell because it depends on the condition and you have to look at the condition and find out if it's dead. And that's very difficult to be able to do that. But, uh, but, but obviously most of our formatting tools, and in Smalltalk this makes it easy, just agree upon a consisting formatting and open it up and say format, and it gives me a nice format on that. Now, the second, so those, that's the first one, but, but it's important, but believe it or not, how many people I see that forget about that and have these big commented out pieces of code throughout there, and now other teams come on, and I'm talking about organizations with millions of lines of whatever code, I've seen it in Smalltalk, I've seen it in Java, C Sharp, Ruby, whatever, people go along and they leave all this dead code around, or they, they, they temporarily commented out, but they never removed it, and then new people come in to maintain it, and they're wondering, what does this mean? So it's a stumbling block for me. So it's not only commented code, but but there's other things. But uh, so we should delete useless comments, delete commented out code, trust the version, trust our version control system. I can always go back and get it or reinvent it, probably better. Um, also, lame names. Now, Elliot can't answer this, okay, if he's here, or any of the other top-notch language people, because they might know what this algorithm does. Ralph can't answer this either, but this is a very famous computer science algorithm that all beginning computer scientists have to learn. Do you know what this does? Well, for those of you that don't like some C kind of code, how about if we convert it to small talk? How, what does that do now? Now, Elliot can't... I mean, that's, I've seen small talk that ugly. We were seeing the decompiled stuff. Notice the decompiled stuff did the variable names very similar. I should have done that. Just, just decompiled the one and done that. Um, well, it's got recursion going on, so maybe we'll try something else. But let's remove the recursion. Does that help a little bit? Maybe some of you don't like recursion. I, I grew up in the Lisp world, so I like recursion a lot, but okay. does that help? How about now? Does that help? Okay. I mean, this is a famous algorithm. Maybe I should have just actually rewritten the original recursive algorithm in Smalltalk, because you can do recursion in Smalltalk as well. But, I mean, names mean everything. And it's so, so important. I'm not writing, using a programming language to communicate to the computer. The computer understands what? Zeros, ones, whatever I want to use. It's really, I'm trying to communicate to myself so I even remember what it did next week when I look back at it. Sometimes I look at what I wrote and I'm like, huh? What did I do there? But I'm also trying to communicate to other people. So fixing names should mean something. And unfortunately, refactoring tools in almost any language, starting with small talk, but now it's become the norm in a lot of languages, is there. And so we should use the standard protocols if they have them. But if not, if you, you can use your standard naming conventions, but if you don't have them, don't do it. Now, Kent Beck's book that he talks about, he really focused on, he had 83 patterns in there in the small talk book. By the way, if you Google small talk best practice patterns, you can get a free version of that book <laughs> that's actually was right before it went to press. It was like a, a, a review version. And also, like, Small Talk by Example has a lot of clean code examples in there as well. So if you're newer to Small Talk and want to do that, get, I would highly recommend you can get a free version, or you can still buy the Amazon version, I think. But really, when you look at Kent Beck's pra uh, pa patterns, what he was focusing on is the readability is more important than the readability of the method itself. What's nice is if I just look at quick sort, and I don't even have to look at how you implemented it. And if it works... Only on time I have to look at how you implemented it is if, it, if I have problems with it or need to optimize it. But if I'm able to just use it at that high level, you're, you're writing a language, you're creating a language to communicate with me. The name should specify what, not the how. And, and method names, if there's a standard names, we should follow them. So in small talk, you have a lot of, a lot of standard names like as, uh, as, you know, when you want to convert as string or, or as date 
I should use that standard because new small talk people are used to it and they'll already recognize it. If not, he even talks about how to do that. But there's two main kind of methods is what Kent claims is change state of receiver or return value from receiver. Watch out for side effects because sometimes when you tell it to do something it might have side effects. Try to avoid that if you can. Like updating, doing, <coughs> updating a lot of other things. But usually what he says is you're changing the state of the receiver, the met you should use a verb phrase. So think things like in, in English, like translate with or add or paint or display yourself on this. So you're using kind of a verb phrase, so that way it's easy to talk about that. So these are some good patterns for being able to know how to name things. If it's, a, if it's a returning a value, give me your social security number. Now in Java, they always use git, right? So git name, git, uh, you know, so, uh, but then you use properties if you're doing C sharp or whatever. So depending on what language you use, you use whatever their naming technique is. And there's even a lot of these extra specialized names. I don't have time in 30 minutes to go through all these. I could easily just spend an hour or so, because there's a lot of cool things like query methods. You know, has, use is or has, is what Kent Beck says. And you, you see the same thing in Java. Or if you do translating with, uh, you tell it to converter, um, uh, how, how you do that in, in Java, you'll do like two verses in, in small talk. So you have Boolean property settings as well. Now, I, I, could, I couldn't uh, do something, uh, say something about a lot of his patterns without sneaking in the nested guard clause, okay? Because this, this is something that you see in a lot of code, too. A lot of times you'll see you're really trying to check a lot of these conditions, and the real results go way down here. But that's, the method is route, get your pay amount. You can really simplify methods a lot by having these guard clauses just to get rid, get out of this method if this is not, this is not getting the regular pay amount, uh, you know, return the dead amount if you've, if you've died, maybe you've got some kind of, your wife gets some whatever, or maybe that's zero, I don't know. Or if you're separated or, or whatever, vacate. So otherwise you can kind of go through there. So he, he has a lot of patterns that I would highly recommend. And, and to summarize this is really how you write code should be a really strong factor of how to extend and maintain the code. Specifically, if you want to, for new developers, not only for myself, because I might kind of remember the weird naming things I did, but I'm not, I, I, if, if we want this to survive and sustain it in the long run, use uh, good techniques for that. Names should be intention refilling and, and make si and sizes mean everything. Okay? So, obviously, refactoring for the name, the, whether it's the instance variable, your uh, method or even your class, uh, the class is a little bit different, but when you rename things, uh, usually the test impact is very minimal because it, the, most of the tools just automatically rename it for you, as long as you go find the test and update the test to use the new name. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a safe, simple refactoring, but I'm shocked sometimes or maybe a really surprised, maybe not so surprised anymore because I've been traveling a lot and I work at a lot of do consulting in a lot of different industries, is how many people are afraid to do this simple refactoring because they come in and feel they're not empowered to do something like this. Whereas this, this adds a lot of meaning to things. Now, another code smell we had is do everything exactly once. You know, it's, it's the, uh, the dry principle. Uh, don't repeat yourself. Um, and, and we might have many copies, and, and therefore we have to somewhat maintain that in many different places. And so... When, when you're fixing duplicate code, and, and I don't have enough time to go into all the details, but you're really moving identical methods up to the superclass, or maybe you create a common component. There's a piece of code uh, very similar in a lot of methods. So you copy out that piece of common code. If it's in the same class, you just extract it to a method and then call it in all the repeated places. If it's repeated in separate, different classes, maybe you create a helper class or decide one class that it should stay in and then delegate to that. Um, so we remove, remove it wherever you find it, extract it to a third function, extract it to a super class maybe or another class. Um, Kit, uh, uh, Michael Feathers talks about sprout classes where as you're writing new code to or legacy code, you can do that out and you can delegate to it. So then you have also this other code smell large things, classes and methods which accumulate too much functionality. And this is a hint that it has too much responsibility and it makes it harder to reuse. Smaller things are easier to reuse. So, uh, in fact, what this usually does is it violates what's called the single responsibility principle. You want to make a method worse, like just passing another parameter, 
pass in a flag, do whatever. Um, so it behaves different depending on the value of the flag. So then all of a sudden we're starting to maintain that. And so really, if, if a method, if you're saying the method does this and that and that, or sometimes it does this in a special case, think about maybe that should be split into a couple methods or a couple classes with that. Um, maybe you do a sprout method. Uh, you don't make legacy code worse. Uh, so, uh, and you can test it a lot better. So, like with a re consider a method like this, returning a boolean, add sensor with name and with port. Oops, you can see I left a, a, a thing in here, messed up. So this is where I need a live environment that can actually test uh, my, my, I need small talk in my actual uh, presentation stuff. Then I could have actually tested this code as I, as I went. I took a piece of code that I had gotten from somebody else and converted it from uh, C++ to, uh, which is scary, <laughs> to uh, small talk, and, and I missed, I, I can see one of these ugly squiggly brackets, right? And a uh, little parentheses there. Yes, I see that, I see that. And, and so, so this would not compile. So this is not, so, so, so with that, but how many responsibilities does this method have? It says add sensor, the type of whatever the type is, and um, with port, and then so we, we check the sensor count. If it's greater than the sensor capacity, uh, if true, we do that. So the method length in that is really the long methods and these complicated methods. Yes, it's not the problem. The symptom, the symptom really, if you have a long method, is really you should look at what is it violating. The longer the method is, the more likely it's to violate the single responsibility principle. So it's, it's not always the, the case that sometimes to optimize, you may need a method long, a uh, long method to be able to do everything that you have. But, but you need to make sense of that. And, and really, it's what's going on in the method. In, in the, uh, for most, most systems that I see people working with, you don't, in general, you don't need, the optimization problem is not there. It's, it's not like Elliot when he's trying to optimize a virtual machine and make that really, really, really fast. And you have to do a lot of tricks to be able to really get those optimization type techniques. For most type of software, in the business world anyway, the slow part is your network connection, your database stuff, other types of things going on. So a lot of times what I do is I make it work, make it right, and then go in towards the optimization later if you find those bottleneck problems. And so by making it right, we try to make sure it's readable. And a lot of that is trying not to violate this long methods. Similar like comments. Well, I'm not against comments, but if you see a lot of large methods and, and they have commented piece of codes, methods are usually easier to read if you don't have that. So once again, hopefully the, uh, I didn't compile this, so so maybe there is a, an error in my small talk. I took some other examples I had and converted them to small talk last night, so hopefully it doesn't have t too many uh, bugs in it. It'd be better if I had a live environment. Then I, that was a cool thing about small talk. You could just highlight something and say inspect it or do it. And then you instantly get that feedback, you know, of what's going on. But what's going on here is like, well, we're printing the banner. Maybe we're printing some details, the printing the header details and all this. It, if, if, when you see large messages, usually comments have this identifiable piece of code. And this is at different levels. This is another one of Kent Beck's patterns. He said everything at the method should be at the same level. So we can use extract method. And Martin Fowler talks about the manual way of doing this in case you don't have tools. You create a new method, copy the source code, identify the parameters and return and update the references. But fortunately, with most refactoring tools, you just grab that piece of code and then tell it to uh, uh, extract to the new method name. So what's going on here is what we really want to do is, is now this is at the same level, print banner, print the details, and print the footers. This might be for orders, so there could be a lot of complicated stuff going on in here. And, and so as we're evolving to this, uh, this is this is a nice technique. The nice the one thing about extract method that gets me. I, I was at a, a company just recently. I'm doing a little bit of business up in Brazil at a large financial company with regulated stuff, and they're growing at 100 percent a year. A good problem to have, even in a down economy in Brazil. Uh, but one of the problems they're having is they're having Conway's law, and the code is kind of growing tremendously and having a lot of problems with it as well. And, and a lot of the new developers come on, and, and they all. So when they have a new requirement, they just add a new parameter, 
They add a new parameter, and then they add a new case statement in here. And they don't realize that they can do extract method. They're afraid to. And, and so I'm trying to get them over that mindset that at any time you do extract method, that's a totally safe refactoring. Even if you don't have tests, it, it's pretty hard to break something when you're doing extract method. You still want to have tests, don't get me wrong, but if we do extract method, then you can even make it more testable as you go. So the test impact is really, your test should not break because we're taking the API and just taking a chunk of code in here that was too big and pulling this out. In fact, something that Kent Beck does, he, he told, told us about, is Kent Beck, if he sees a really long method, what he does is, maybe I'm talking about maybe a thousand line method or multiple thousand line method, is he, he does a, what he calls a method object refactoring, which is in his book as well. But he'll create a new object, take all that chunk of code, put it in that new object, <laughs> that big method. Then he'll delegate from the old method, passing in values you need, keeping it working. Then he can start refactoring this without affecting the original piece. And a lot of times you see new objects begging to come out as you do that kind of refactoring. And you can apply a lot of safe refactorings as you go through uh, with this. So I'm probably reaching about my time, about five more minutes is what I'm looking at here. So, I mean, I, I could go through many more of these. I don't, uh, like I said, I could easily talk, I, I have, I could easily talk about many of these um, from move method to conditional complexity to all that. But let me kind of jump down to big refactorings. Martin Fowler actually talked about this in his book as well. So, the, the, these are not so safe, <laughs> right? But tease apart inheritance, or sometimes, uh, for example, Brian Foote, one of my colleagues, he's working on where they had original uh, real-time embedded system in C code, then they decided to make it C++, so they just wrapped C++ around. So you had procedural design converted to try to be object design. So how do you do that refactoring or se separate your domain? So there's a time to do refactoring and there's a time not to do it. Regular refactorings make it safe and it's easy to do. So when you're fixing bugs, Obviously, you're in the codes, so you see the code smells. Oh, I'm in here fixing this bug. It's, it's like being at the campground, picking up my mess and cleaning it up as I'm there. So, ooh, let me go ahead. There's a pop can here that somebody else left. Let me get it, pick it up and throw it away with my garbage. If I see a bad name, let me rename it right there or extract method right there. Same way when you're adding features. Obviously, if you're right before release, you don't want to do any major refactorings. But right after release, you have breathing time. So it's a good time to do that. Um, it's, pre it's important to have tests, but you need more than just unit tests. So here's uh, some strategy. Sometimes you extend refactor. Because sometimes I, when I'm extending, I see the code smells, or I'm creating code smells, and I see duplication. Other times, before I extend, it's so messy, I have to sometimes, it's easier to do a little bit of cleanup to add this new feature and then extend it uh, from that. Same way with debugging. So I had this yesterday. There's two main refactoring types. But Jim Shore, for example, he, he talks about having this as part of your daily work. And Martin Fowler also says work refactoring into your daily routine. You do it all the time. In almost all cases, you shouldn't just set aside huge time for just doing refactoring. If you put it off too long, and, and if we make it part of our regular mindset, if, if, our whole team, if all our teams are constantly paying attention to keeping things clean, a lot of small steps go a long ways. Fortunately, there's a lot of tools that help. And something that was pointed out by Murphy Hill in his study with a lot of industry people doing refactoring, these are the main ones that people do almost regularly that get the most benefits. Rename, move, extract method, pull up, inline, uh, extract class interface. So what, what's extract interface for small talk? Yes, create abstract class, right? A pure abstract class is kind of like an interface. Is same thing, or uh, you know. So these, but these are the main ones, and so people should never. Be, uh, these are common things that you should just make it part of your regular development and your tool sets. Um, obviously, you want to use tools. A lot of the tools evolve from the small talk community. Just to finish on this. Uh, rename is always safe. Extract method. Well, it, you know, unless you have some reflection or some other weird things going on. So you can do some things you have to be worried about, but if you're worried about reflection, so I'm actually doing this rename, me and John Branner are cleaning up a lot of dead code in this, this one company I was telling you about up in Sao Paulo, Brazil, is there for if, if we're worried about reflection or some dynamic service, we leave the old method in uh, and still log it 
as we're doing the rename. And, and that way you can do the delegation and then you can find out who's calling it reflectively and then update that as well. So there's still some techniques you can do to, to keep that safe as well. It, uh, push up, pull down. Pu pull up is always safe. It's exactly the same. If you pull it up and you have different conditions, now you're going to create a template method or something like that, th then you have to kind of be careful and kind of test what you're doing. Create common components. Fairly safe, but sometimes can be harder to share. So anyway, uh, uh, sorry to push that so quick, but they told me I only had 30 minutes and I didn't want to violate the rules uh, from this. But uh, it's really good to be here again and definitely at a small talk conference. I, you know, I love small talk. Uh, and I'm around for the next day or two and hopefully get a chance to talk to a lot of people. I don't know if we have time for any questions or what. It's up to you. Okay. Thank you. Gracias. It's a what? Sorry, I didn't quite hear what you said it was. It's a... No, no, I would say that um, when you mix up the single rhythm, the violation of the single rhythm possibility principle and fast method names, you can enter a situation where the name is not... Yes, yes. Oh, right. I got you. Don't eat uh, good names and don't die. Well, I, I don't die, or you die, because sometimes <laughs> you see an object method, which when you, when you go inside the method, it takes and creates and leaves some stuff, and when if you don't enter that detail, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see that, all that stuff. That's right. And... So maybe the early refactoring is you do refactor it to that longer name because you're trying to say, what does this do? But then that can be kind of... In fact, I remember uh, Ralph telling me once about a refactoring that he did uh, a long time ago. He, he, uh, he told me that if he sees a commented block of code, that his first refactoring he could do quick is just take all the spaces out of the comment and refactor to that long, ugly name. But then since it's so ugly that you can rename it, you, once you figure out more of what it does. And so, but, but if you have multiple responsibilities, you're trying to name it well, it does this and that and this and that, and we're trying to make this big, ugly name. But then how can we break that out? Is there some natural breakouts to some next refactorings, like some extract methods, or maybe there are some new classes that should even come out from that. But that's a good point. If you have both, not only bad names, but then violating the single responsibility. And in most code bases that I look at, there's many types of code smells going on. So then you, sometimes people feel overwhelmed how can I even make progress on this big ball of mud to tease out this spaghetti code? But how do you do it? You do, a, well, while I'm working, I just take a lot of small steps. Any code I work on, I try to do a lot of cleanup. And if we can get the whole team or many teams doing that in the organization where it becomes part of the mindset of the code that we're working on, it's amazing what can happen within three to six months or so, how that code base can really become something new that, that is more habitable. So it's not trying to make it perfect. It's trying to make it, you know, per perfection is the enemy of good enough. But it's trying to make it good enough, but something I can live with and maintain and extend. Right, right over here, one more. Okay. Um, I think that um, there are many rules, stops, uh, best practices, um, all of them. Those things that you are uh, reviewing are, are very important because they provide a lot of contributions from other experience, etc. But there is something else I think we can do. Especially those who have the responsibility to work on the, at the system level. The people that are uh, creating new small environments or uh, on that family, uh, when they uh, are programming the environment, the development environment, they have to pay a lot more of attention to the quality of the code because that's the code that the application program will take as a reference. 
So people will copy essentially the patterns and ideas that are in the development environment. So I consider that critical because your application size is up to you. But if the development environment doesn't uh, consistently uh, show and force the, the good uh, patterns, uh, then uh, the rest of the parameters will get confused and add more noise to that case. Yeah, very good point. In fact, when I learned small talk, that was the beauty of small talk is you always look at the collection hierarchy, your magnitudes. You learn a lot. You also can look at examples in the library that you don't like. So it's the library itself, and that's the main part with, with small talk. So develop environment makes it easy to do that. But if the, but I also even think to extend what you're saying. So I, I agree with that. But I would even want a better development environment that maybe even helps me even think about. Those types of things. I mean, some development environments can give me some clues or trigger when there's some smells. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of that. But it, it's potential that maybe even the way we're thinking about dis writing code and stuff, we think is cool today, but maybe 20 years from now, it's like dark matter. There's a lot of stuff we don't know. Maybe we realize there's even a better way to even design code that doesn't create a lot of accidental complexity. So how can we avoid some of that accidental complexity? But yeah, I mean, it's good to have good working examples. Ralph and I were just talking about this morning. We've noticed that a lot of Java people sometimes don't do that. But in Smalltalk, you actually, when you learn it, you do look at the library. And you learn from that, and that helps you think about good object design. Mostly where I learned about thinking, Smalltalk is simple. When, when Ralph teaches it, within a couple of hours, he said, okay, that's it. You've, now you know Smalltalk. And you really do, because the syntax is simple. But the library takes a long time, and that's where you really learn object think and good design and what makes for so most of the small talk library you look at the the hierarchy of the collection higher uh, the collection hierarchy is only like maybe four or five levels deep it's not very deep at all whereas when i see somebody else's code that has 15 levels i'm like um <laughs> you know maybe there's that's kind of a code smell too is how love uh, so you can learn a lot by looking at those different types of things so very good point so thank you very much thank you.